Hello and welcome to Wix, the Women in Data Science Conference, which is so happy to have you here, both at Stanford and anywhere in the world at satellite events or through the live stream. We hope you really enjoy the speakers, the speakers that we will present to you at WITS here at Stanford, but also the local speakers at your events. Enjoy. Welcome to Stanford. This is an extraordinary group of people assembled here, and I wish you a successful conference. Hi, I'm a WITS ambassador because I believe strongly that supporting women in data science leads to better data science practices. I became a WITS ambassador because I wanted to create a community which supports the challenges and motivation of Nigerian women data scientists. As we know, data science is transforming the world now, and I want Nigerian women data scientists to be part of that transformation. I am Carmen Martinez. I am the WITS ambassador for Madrid, and I'm hosting the event for the second year because I think we must empower the next generation in the disciplines that will shape the future. This last year has been very active for women worldwide and we have made a lot of noise. But now the key point is that we also make a lot of progress. I believe the women still must have a voice. Hi, I'm Miso Gura, a software engineer at Accurus in London. We're so excited for London to hold its first ever WITS conference this year. I became a WITS ambassador after changing careers from cancer biology and I was shocked how few women there were in my field. So I want to promote and engage more women and non-binary people in data science. I'm the WITS ambassador for Toronto. I became an ambassador to expose women to the different applications of data science across different industries. I am a Women in Data Science ambassador because I like seeing more women playing an active role in the development of the field and finding creative solutions to worldwide problems through science and technology. This is Julian from Mumbai. I became a WITS ambassador to create a strong community of technical women in Mumbai, one where women can learn and inspire one another. Thank you WITS for giving me this opportunity. My name is Nikki Mulder. I'm a professor and head of the Computational Biology Division at the University of Cape Town. I also lead H3 Bionic, which is a Pan-African Bioinformatics Network, and we will be hosting a WIDS conference site. So this will be a set of sites across Africa, and we aim to build capacity for genomics research in Africa, which is why I'm a WIDS ambassador. I'm very interested in developing data science skills in women. Hello, I'm Kat College, Stanford Women in Data Science Ambassador for 2018 in New Zealand. I'm delighted to be bringing this event to New Zealand along with so many WIDS ambassadors around the world so that we can inspire more young girls and women to take up careers in data science and data engineering. Hi, I'm Bafa Wahida from Qatar. I am a Women in Data Science Ambassador because I believe in collaborative learning and contributing to the community. And through the event, I hope to share ideas and build a community for data science here in Qatar. I'm Mami Peralta from La Nación Data in Buenos Aires, Argentina. I want to be a WITS Ambassador because I believe we need more women in strategic positions to apply technology for good and for social change. WPI is proud to offer a truly interdisciplinary data science program with a very diverse group of students. One motivation for becoming WIDS Ambassadors is to provide a platform to celebrate this diversity that we have. It's our goal to inspire collaboration by bringing local women together and to elevate the impact of the work of all of the participants at our Women in Data Science event. We are the Wage Ambassadors in Berlin. I'm Eleanor from Data Economy Slash Data Natives. <laughs> and I'm Anya and I'm working for SAP in Berlin. And we are here to empower the women in data science. All right. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> uh, Welcome to Women in Data Science Oslo, not Stanford. Uh, the Stanford conference was for the third time in Stanford now this Monday. Uh, just to give you a little bit of context here, uh, the Women in Data Science started three years ago at Stanford with a local conference profiling a lot of talented female data scientists. 
Last year, they decided to reach out to the worldwide community to have satellite events around the world uh, and created a huge event with, I think, 77,000 participants. Uh, so we don't have the final numbers in yet this year because, well, we're finishing today and there are other events coming up around the world. But in addition to this event at Stanford on Monday, which was live streamed and available directly there, they have 177 events around the world in 155 cities and, in, and 53 countries. So we are part of something quite huge, to be honest, and it's really inspiring, I think. So this is Women in Data Science Oslo, but we are also doing live, live streaming, and I also want to say well, I want to say welcome to you who are here, first of all, but I also want to say welcome to uh, the people gathered in at NTNU in Trondheim at the, and at the University of Agder, who are also live streaming directly. And hopefully, uh, we will get some questions on Twitter as well. So if you have any questions and are following us from somewhere else, this is the hashtag the to use, and we'll try to get in as many questions as we can. But we, we have a fairly tight schedule, so we need to make sure that we are finished in time, and so we can hear all the wonderful lectures. So, so we have five lectures lined up for you, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to them. They span quite a large area or different subject matters, from energy and healthcare to the media and marketing and finance. So, uh, this Women in Data Science event actually started at 9 o'clock this morning with a workshop. And uh, at the workshop, there was a competition in anomaly detection. And uh, I'd like to introduce Kristin uh, um, from Arundel Analytics, who's here to present the prizes for the best solutions. Uh, so thanks to everyone that participated in the workshop. We actually managed to get uh, quite a few models uh, deployed through our software, which we're really, really happy about. So thank you for that. And we also had quite a few very good models. So I have three winners, or the three best models. And I have three prizes, some gift certificates, some micro bits, and some branded uh, Arundo chargers. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the third best model was Flavia Karsgrande. Yeah. <laughs> and then the if you come up here. And then the second best was Signe Mu. <laughs> and the very best model was Sulvei Dinger. <laughs> So we're ready to get started. Uh, the first presentation is uh, Balasa Priyakotu and Hyun Wu. Apologies if I mangled your name, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, they both come from eSmart Systems. Um, they have backgrounds and PhDs in medical in imaging processing, signal processing and machine learning. And they will talk about digital intelligence and deep learning for the energy sector. Hello everyone, can you hear me? Yes, um, my name is Huyen and uh, we are two ladies from East Martin Handen and last year she's sitting down there, she will share the talk with me later. Um, so I will go uh, to the uh, introduction of the uh, uh, presentation today. Um, and then I will talk about the deep learning uh, for automated power line inspection uh, to recognize objects in images and detect phones and anomaly in images. 
And then Lassia will tell you more about the load prediction. Uh, eSmart System is a growing company where we develop the next generation of IT systems for smart utilities, energy markets, and cities. And um, at eSmart, in our analytics team, we are working currently with machine learning and big data in these areas, load prediction to uh, predict uh, the load for substation management, to predict the demand response for planning, EV charging, uh, to predict the peak load after outage, uh, segmentation and profiling. Uh, the purpose is to segment different groups of uh, customers to inform new pricing models, uh, to identify is there any change in the load, for example, if there is there any newly installed solar panel or EV charging. Um, uh, and uh, next is uh, risk monitoring. To um, The data is aggregated to estimate the risk of outage and uh, meter failure. And uh, fa failure and normally detection, the purpose is to detect components and uh, phones in the images from uh, many images. And uh, in the scope of this presentation, I will talk about the use of deep learning for uh, power line auto automated inspection. Uh, hundreds of thousands of images are taken from the drones uh, for analysis. Uh, one of the tasks is to recognize objects in the image, for example, to recognize the power mast, power poles, power lines, cross arms, illustrators. We have experience with various state-of-the-art models. Um, and for example, Faster RCNN, RFCN from Microsoft, YOLO from Facebook, SSD from Google. And one of the challenges in our case is that usually the images taken by the drones are large in dimension and high resolution. Therefore, it uh, takes a lot of time to process such a large image. Um, uh, it will it make it somehow invisible to use it in real-time application. Another issue is that usually the pre-trained model uh, typically work on uh, large resolution and small images. Um, uh, therefore, we propose a two-stage process to first detect the object in the low resolution image and then crop it from the high resolution image for the next step is to classify it. This uh, video shows the example of uh, the reason of the two-stage pipeline model. I don't know why it doesn't show the video. Uh, come on. <laughs> it was working before. I'm sorry for this. I don't know why. Um, OK. Um, I'm uh, but it was, uh, yeah, it worked earlier. I didn't have to do anything. OK, that's OK. I think uh, I would just continue. Um, so we have experience in fighting several uh, pre-trained models uh, on apply on our data. And uh, as you can see from this uh, table, SSD and uh, SSD is the fastest, uh, and faster RCNN is the slowest, uh, based on the speed uh, frame per second. Uh, and the two models, SSD and YOLO, are the fast and accurate on small objects. And the other two models are uh, working better on b uh, bigger objects. Uh, sorry, it should be the other way around. The two models, SSD and YOLO, work uh, better in big objects. And the other two models uh, are better in uh, small objects. Uh, and. Uh, Another task is to classify the objects. This image shows the uh, example of 21 classes of insulators. And the insulators are classified based on the shape and the material 
and the way they are attached to the power mast. This video shows the result of the detection and classification. Thanks God, it worked. <laughs> 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 and the building box uh, shows the detected object and the, uh, the small digit you see on the box is the uh, confidence uh, of the detection. Another task is to uh, detect the phones at, at normally in the images. Uh, at eSmart, we are developing the intelligence uh, assistance system to assist the uh, power line inspectors in their job to identify if there, if there is any phone so that they can know and have a proper actions such as cutting down the tree on or replace old components with the new ones or other maintenance activities to ensure the safety of the crews and the efficiency of providing energy to their customers. Uh, there are several kinds of phones that they want to detect. For example, um, sometimes the tree is very close by the power line and when the tree grows up, it can touch the power line. Uh, in winter, due to the massive amount of snow, the weight of the snow can bend a branch of a tree and it can lay down on the power line like in this uh, image. Uh, so uh, the inspector would need to know if this happens so that it can come to the area and cut down the tree or remove the tree from the power line. Another kind of phone is the broken insulator. In this case, the broken one needs to be replaced with a new one. Uh, another kind of phone is a crack um, uh, pole. Uh, the sever severity of the crack depends on the width and the depth of the crack and the inspector need to know uh, this uh, so that it can decide whether they should replace the pole with a new one or not. Um, missing top pad uh, is the one that is marked with the red budding box here is also kind of forms. This is normal and this is the missing top pad. Another problem is with the woodpecker where the woodpecker make the hole on the uh, pole. Bensling, uh, I don't know the word of bensling in English, but I can explain. Uh, it's, uh, it's a piece of wire to attach the uh, insulator to the uh, power line more stably. And usually there are two cases, uh, two problems with the bensling. It can be loose due to bad mounting techniques, or it can be rusted due to the effect of the weather. And in this case, the inspector want to know so that they can replace the new bensling. Another problem is with the broken power lines. And um, together with our customer, we can add new more intelligence feature into the system to uh, support um, them more in the jobs. And last year, I will tell you more about the load prediction. Thank you. Uh, very good afternoon. Uh, today I'm going to present uh, load forecasting uh, at various aggregation levels and at very, uh, various horizons. With the development of uh, smart grids, we have a lot of challenges and opportunities in the field. Load forecasting has always been part of maintaining uh, power systems, but it is done at a very higher aggregation levels, like for countries, for big cities, or for big regions. But with the development of smart grids, we can have load consumption data at uh, higher granularity and higher frequencies with the help of smart meters. Uh, in eSmart systems, we have different sites where we have installed smart meters at different places. And at Waller, a small island group uh, in Norway, we have thousands of smart meters installed. In the next slide, we can see the overall consumption, hourly consumption at Waller site from 2010 to 2014. In this uh, load consumption uh, time series, we can see seasonal effects. In summers, the consumption is low. In winters, it's high. And also, there are occasional peaks. It's, these peaks are mostly in the weekends. And also, there are these local maximums during summertime. The average consumption is slightly higher. It's because uh, 
of large number of cabins uh, that are present in water. It's a vacation place, kind of vacation place. For this load consumption data, we made prediction models uh, uh, to predict next 24 hours at substation level. We have used uh, different techniques to make these uh, prediction models. We have used uh, ARMA, autoregressive moving average. We have used uh, two versions of double season halt winters. We have used NRAX random forest and semi-parametric ARMA. In all these methods, uh, random forest method worked better, which gave an absolute uh, per percentage error of 3%. Uh, it requires less training data, that it requires uh, three months of training data, and the only problem with this method is it can't predict long-term trend. And it has to be retrained uh, after a certain period of, after certain period. While we are using all these methods, we have found that uh, somehow it, the, all these models try to <coughs> learn the mean average behavior of the total consumption, but we need to predict peak consumption, which is very important to avoid grid consumption. Uh, here is an eSmart applic uh, app application where we get notified whenever a substation uh, goes beyond a threshold, uh, which uh, indicates that there is congestion in the distribution grid. And here, whenever the substation, we can locate the substation. Uh, yeah, the overloaded substations here, if you can see. <laughs> on the map. Uh, we use different prediction models for this, uh, where we find local maximas in the load consumption, and then uh, try to interpolate these lo local uh, maximas and find a new time series. We give this time series as input to prediction models, which predicts peaks. And uh, these days, we are using a lot of power-intensive devices, like uh, what what instant water heaters, heat pumps, induction cooktops, and EV chargers. Uh, they can cause stress on the distribution grid, and it affects the quality of service. Uh, this problem can be uh, reduced with the help of smart homes. Here we can see an example of a smart home. In a smart home, the customer is no longer called uh, a customer, but he is a prosumer. Way he produces his own energy, and he also consumes. Uh, here in this diagram, we can see the rooftop has uh, PV panels, which produces uh, electricity locally and which is stored in a wall battery. Here, okay, battery somewhere, which is stored in a wall battery. Uh, the use of these power intensive devices can be scheduled according to a plan uh, so that there are no uh, peak load consumption and, no, uh, and it doesn't stress the grid. How can we empower the prosumer so that he can um, uh, he can he doesn't uh, uh, consume lot amounts of energy? We can use data analytics and operation research uh, so that the demand side flexibility can be exploited. Uh, as a part of uh, analytics team, we have made a lot of prediction models at uh, household and device level for the load consumption. Here in this application, uh, it's called Empower Project. Uh, we made uh, predictions for local production and local load at household. Ho and here, the predictions are for uh, local st battery storage. In the coming slides, I will uh, show you predictions and data for various uh, appliances and household level, and commercial also in, uh, at commercial buildings. Here we can see predictions, uh, load data, and uh, predictions for smart meters. With the help of smart meters, we get overall consumption at household and commercial buildings. Uh, from the household consumption data, we, we can't see much pattern like in Waller data, where it's at a higher aggregator level. That's overall consumption for the whole Waller site. But at household level, the randomness is very high. It totally depends upon the household behavior that is number of uh, inhabitants in the house, number of kids, if there are any working or non-working people, it depends on that. Here in the adjoining graph here, we can see predictions. Uh, 
the cyan color is the original data and the uh, yellow color is, uh, is are the predictions. Um, for commercial buildings, which is on a higher aggregation level, the load consumption is constant, excepting for higher peaks on some days. For uh, household level predictions, we have used data-driven techniques. Um, where we used features from past consumption and from weather data to make prediction models. Here, uh, we predicted 24 hours ahead, but at quarter hour intervals, that is every 15 minutes. The horizon has decreased even further. And coming to the next appliance, uh, it's electric floor heating. Here you can see data and predictions for household and commercial building. Uh, from the predictions, you can see the electric flow heater will switch on and switch off at irregular time intervals. So predicting at this level is uh, quite a challenge here. For this type of uh, devices, we have used a combination of classification and regression models, where the classification model first finds when the device is switched on and off, and the regression model try to find the level of consumption when the device is switched on. In commercial building, uh, the load consumption is almost constant, ex excepting on few days when there are holidays or uh, weekends. It can be anything. And going to the next uh, device, uh, it's they are uh, electric vehicles. Here we can see uh, data for electric vehicles. We don't have much data at household level. Here, we, uh, from the predictions, we can see that the electrical vehicles are used only for a short period of time. Uh, here I have shown you good examples where we are able to predict properly, but usually it's not the case. The, the usage of electric charges is quite random and it's very hard to predict. And the next device, next device is uh, water heaters and water beds. They have a pattern, they are a bit similar to electric floor heating and uh, they are very hard to predict, except, uh, excepting here the usage mo most u used time. Uh, we can't predict the rest of the hours that properly here. And the final one is uh, predicting uh, local uh, local uh, generation units. Here we have PV panels and uh, commercial wind turbines. If you have good local forecasts, uh, we can get reasonable predictions at uh, at household level. And uh, I would conclude my presentation with the final topic here. It's uh, customer profiling. Uh, we segment class customers based on load consumption here. It's very useful for both the operators and retailers because they can give a particular group of customers uh, dedicated tariffs and special services. Here we have found uh, load representative patterns. Uh, we have collected these patterns directly from the load consumption. These are mainly dependent on uh, four factors, that is uh, season and uh, calendar. These four, uh, we have four represent, uh, load representative patterns, uh, which are from summer weekday, summer weekend, winter weekday, and winter weekend. We have used uh, non-supervised uh, learning, uh, non learning techniques like KNN, spherical KNN, historical clustering, and uh, self-organization maps uh, to cluster customers. In the next slide, we can see some 25, a group of 25 clus clusters where the customers have the uh, same type of uh, load consumption. We, eSmart has built an interactive tool where we can um, analyze the customer uh, segments here. Uh, with this, uh, I would like to conclude my presentation. Thank you for your uh, attention. Uh, happy Women's Day. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, any questions? Yeah. Uh, sorry, can you, can you go back to the previous slides? Yeah. Uh, I okay. was wondering uh, which te technique do you use to to uh, to customer uh, 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 different customers? Uh, we used KNN, uh, spherical KNN, historical clustering. We have tried different techniques. It's uh, initial study we have done here. And also self-organizing maps we have used even then. 
Any other questions? So I was wondering about drones. Uh, yeah. I guess the, the classification of uh, what is happening to a component is very dependent on the trajectory of the drone that is taking the photographies. How do you sort of make it have good coverage of the different angles and all these kind yeah. of things? Yes, uh, that's a very good question. Actually, we are also struggling with that. So um, uh, the angle to take the photo is very important. Uh, and also um, the distance from the drone to the uh, components uh, is also important. Um, yesterday I have a talk with m uh, my um, CEO and he said that he's uh, working with the people to um, s um, develop the autonomous drone to uh, make it uh, more automatically uh, so that uh, the drone can fly in a pattern that we want and in the same angle, so it's easier to train. Yeah? Good. Any more questions? Okay. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> thank you very much. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. And since I didn't remember it earlier, I also have one for you. Thank you so much for the workshop you put on. <laughs> okay. So next up is what I expect is a familiar face here. It's Kristin Bro. She's uh, a professor here at the Institute. She, she's vice head of the Department of Informatics. Uh, and she also heads up the Informatic Systems Research Group, so she'll be talking about using data science to improve, improve public health in developing countries. So, welcome. With or without data, people make decisions. But you can make an informed decision when you have data. DHIS2 makes information available. The value of information lies in the decision that it enables. How many drugs you're going to need, for example, for malaria, in terms of the cases that you've had, that can help you to project how many supplies you're going to need. You can plan around having your staff available for that particular season. These are malaria cases for Neno District. But because of patient work overload, the patients are just so many most of the times. The nurses also on the ground are not enough. That one is also a major challenge. My name is Mbongeni Jizonda, and I'm in charge of the District Health Information System in Malawi. I am in charge of implementing and training users and promoting the usage of the system. Also makes me go around the country, uh, meeting different users of the system and training them and transferring skills on how to use the system. DHIS2 is the main data collection and data aggregation tool. So the Ministry of Health migrated from the paper-based DHIS1 to an online-based DHIS2. It gives us the ability to access data anywhere, regardless of our, of our location, and we can access it at any time. Previously, before we introduced this system, the data that was coming into the system uh, could take one year uh, to come from the facility. 
when we introduced uh, um, the health management information system, uh, things changed for the better. Data was flowing on a timely basis and it was uh, available. And uh, this is one of the critical uh, issues that managers want to make you know, decisions. <laughs> so you can understand we are changing the topic a little, going from, from, uh, from deep learning and into the details of the, um, the data science, into the maybe the appropriateness and the use of the data in order to uh, ad and advance analytics in order to improve uh, health uh, in the global south. This movie that you just saw was made by NORAD for the NORAD conference in December, uh, three months ago, uh, because they have been supporting us since the very beginning. So what I would like to talk about today, which is very much different, but I'm very happy to do it on the, in the Women's Day, because I'm uh, born and raised here at the Department of Informatics. I have, uh, think I've been part of five different attempts and projects to, uh, to um, promote Informatics for females, for girls, to, to um, endorse and join the fantastic uh, possibilities of studying informatics in order to change the world. So I will talk about this project that is actually started already in 1994 as a PhD project, ending up to be a global movement, and now is used in 88 countries. 48 nation nations is using it for the whole infrastructure for the health information systems. And it started as an action research project, and it still is an action research project involving hundreds of people. So this is kind of a very, very different story, but I guess you can listen to a different one. So Nora started um, as supporters already in the beginning when it was started off as a PhD project uh, collaborating with the, with the post-apartheid ANC um, in South Africa in order to reconstruct the health sector from being very, very centralized to be decentralized. That's why we have the D in the district health information systems, because we wanted to decentralize it. And the slogan was already from the very beginning, information for action. And we applied uh, participatory design Scandinavian principles in order to develop these systems. And these kind of uh, principles are still there. We have traveled through technology as well as the geography since 94, uh, and ending up uh, where we are now with a very, very advanced web-based, cloud-based, mobile internet-based, uh, using whatever technology there is on the ground in order to make robust, scalable, sustainable systems. So we started as a um, data warehouse for aggregate, ending up also, if, because if you address uh, health, you very often end up to both for quality issues, but also for health issues to following individuals through health programs. So integration was very is and was very important. Um, and we are talking about platformization. So this is a platform thinking. We are also trying to teach the Norwegian health sector to think in platform instead of silos. So they also could uh, um, cater for, for instance, Digital health card for women, pregnant women, is not existing in Norway. Do you know that? We make that for, for Palestine and for Bangladesh through this platform. So this is just to, to think about that it's not always what you think, that uh, the Global South is so lagging behind. Sometimes it's actually jumping over, uh, or leapfrogging it's called, and going to much more advanced use. So the whole global community, I don't want to go into details because you probably don't know them, but the whole global health community, you know the World Health Organization, I probably know, the NORAD is the Norwegian governmental aid, Gates Foundation you probably heard about, uh, UNICEF and others, everyone is taking part in this movement. And this is kind of an interesting thing in itself. So the brief history is like a, a history of technology, starting off with the, what the, whatever technology that was able to, to get hold of at that point. 
So, so it's not a coincidence that this is actually managed and coordinated by University of Oslo, Department of Informatics. Because we're actually using whatever technology available in order to make advanced and, as I say, robust applications on the ground. But it's then Microsoft Access was what uh, happened. Uh, it was a national standard in South Africa. We worked in South Africa the first six years, actually. And then everybody was looking to South Africa because that's the big brother of the, um, of the Africa. And then in 2004, we started with the first DHS2 Java-based web-based uh, platform, or not at that time platform, of course, because that was not possible. And it started off as an um, open source master course here in Department of Informatics. That master course has been the core in the development since the very beginning. So this is a um, project that started off as a student pro PhD project, student project with master students. The student project with master students is still going on. That uh, project, that uh, course is still there. And the best projects that um, in the last year, last autumn, it was 120 uh, master students. And the best project will be committed into the code and be available for all the, in the platform for the next release for all the, the 88 uh, countries that are using it and the NGOs that are using it at that point. So the web, of course, very important. And then the mobile internet become a revolution for, for this di diffusing, but also for the use of the data and use of them uh, in order to take better decisions. In 2011, it was the first national online uh, DHS2 implementation, cloud-based, mobile internet-based, and it actually reached the whole Kenya in 11 months. And that was the first uh, governmental uh, scale system south uh, of um, sub-Saharan Africa in the world that actually uh, could uh, run on uh, on um, on the mobile internet or on internet online in itself. So the online to be access to access the data online is very very important. I guess you can understand that that you kind of otherwise you will take decision based on the yearly yearbook that you published the year before. So you would never know your situation in your country. And then we also have league tables, so people started to compete. Who has actually the best uh, control over their own data? So, and how could they then do interventions, as we saw in the movie, in order to improve the health service? And then Ghana, based on this, Ghana, Uganda, and Rwanda came super fast after, and half the time. For instance, the, the, the Ghana case was supported by a master student, actually the one that was teaching the open source course this uh, fall. He was the only one supporting Ghana, and they did it themselves. Because it's all about platform. It's all about uh, customis customizing the platform for their own uh, goods. And that's what we teach people to um, create uh, independences, not dependencies. So we have a, a big um, movement of academies that we teach people how can they customize this platform for their own health programs and build capacity in the country. So from 11 to until today, so let's say 11 countries uh, using it scalable for their all, all the health information system. For today, 48. So that's an increase um, uh, that is pretty um, amazing. And we could say something, it's very much to do with the technology that are uh, working for us with mobile internet, um, the, the fiber cable coming to Africa and so forth. But it's also, of course, about money and of, of about all the donors that work together in order to harmonize the capacity in the country through building, supporting building this platform. So that happened. Like. So you can see that's the increase from pilots. And we are using this one because all the pilots want to scale to the whole country later. And here's the, the countries that we are talking about. So uh, the interesting thing I would say here at the Department of Informatics, University of Oslo, is actually this is a research project. A research project that's ending up to be a global standard for the whole global health community. So what did we do? Yeah, action research. Action research is when you do actually um, do an implementation out from the lab into the world, as well as you reflect research and learn about it and share. So it's uh, op action research combined with open source, where everything gets more and merrier by sharing and creating a movement. So we always work with the ministries 
the national government in order to strengthen the capacity in the ministries, in the countries, to create ownership. And we um, build this knowledge of implementation while we actually doing the implementation in partnership. So we need to then create partnerships on the ground. And many ways we do that is actually to look for champions. Mm -hmm. when, we, when we find champions, we enroll them into the international master programs. Or if they have a master, they can be uh, part of the PhD program. And as of now, 48 PhDs has graduated through this program from the Global South. Meaning going back and become work in the ministry, work in the university, creating a HISP group in the country to support their own country. In addition, we have the regional academies. We have had 75 academies regionally, East Africa, West Africa, Cent S Southern Africa, Latin America, uh, Asia, and the Arabic uh, countries are coming up. So they have then, uh, it started off that it was kind of a training to customize their platform to their own needs. Ending up to the most important thing was actually the South-South inspiration, to be learning best practice, uh, because the Kenya example in 2011, that was our first, first um, academy, and then the other countries that just came after was at the same academy. If Kenya can do it, we can do it. So actually the inspiration and learning um, across countries was the most important thing. So we have tried to make a model to, to envision this, but after North Korea, it used to be a rocket, but after North Korea, you know, we, could, we had to take this arrow away. We are, we are aiming for the sustainability goals. We took the arrows away yesterday, actually. And then we see that we are, we are doing local innovation. We work with country by country, by health program and health program. We solve the problem on the ground, and then we use this participatory action research engine to fuel it back to capacity strengthening and platform development. Because the platform is developed here at the Department of Informatics. We have 18 software developers. We have many um, implementers. We have many researchers and PhD students and professors and postdocs that work together with the whole global community in order to learn from each uh, use case and to be part of this next release I and mean, actually, we had a release yesterday, DHS 229. So it's the 29th release. And Joachim, where are you? Are you here? Ah, he left. <laughs> OK. So we have students here. I saw Joachim earlier, um, because master students are also taking part in this development. So the capacity strengthening <coughs> is then through these academies, this curriculum, um, this um, uh <coughs> research that we are talking about. So this is kind of an innovation engine, that's why I say, a capacity building through innovation. This is the platform thinking that uh, the data can come from wherever and shall be displayed on, the advanced analytics shall be displayed on whatever gadget you have. Uh, of course, also on Android phones, when, you when that is the one you have. As of now, since when we worked so much in Africa, we actually didn't do iPhones because we believe that it was actually very, very slow picking up. But coming back from Indonesia, we know that uh, Asia is uh, embracing iPhone, so now we have, you know, work with the iPhones, of, of course, as well. So we are into big countries here. Indonesia is 260 million people. They're very advanced. They have a lot of, of, uh, of advanced systems. So there we, use, um, there we use DHS2 as an integrator, as a web-based platform on top. That could be similar to, to, to Norway, because you have a lot of uh, uh, systems underneath that not talk to each other. And we had a discussion here, just now, about uh, why can, how can it be that Palestine, we are working with Palestine, very tiny country, Gaza and West Bank, on making a digital health card for pregnant women, as well as following up children. That we can do that in Palestine, and we cannot do that in Norway. That's kind of a, you know, not a very good, good news. And we were also thinking that, why, how come the Global South uh, kind of, one thing is the leapfrogging, but the other thing is that they are advancing. Because one thing is, if you look around, that before internet was an um, um, emancipating technology, becoming a control technology, 
through the big five, the Google, the Amazon, and the Facebooks. We are letting all our info ourselves out there. But when it comes to health, we are not able to provide good health systems in Norway because of uh, privacy issues. We're not allowed to use the, the registers. We are not allowed to use the... And I know by heart. I have an old mother, and I, I know. And we need to go with the paper along from the, from the one clinic to the other, to the hospital. Just, we just discussed it. Because it's actually a thing to discuss. But I can see my time is soon up. Just wanted to show that we are tracking pregnant women in Palestine. We are learning from that. Palestine is an advanced country. Very, very skilled people. And few people. And very dense. To Bangladesh, 163 million. So we are doing the same now for Bangladesh. And they have a long history with DHS too. They're very, very creative. They have, they, it was an independent review that said that through this, they reduce the administrative burden, they, uh, they avoid silos, improve patient care, they it make the data available, and then better quality, and they improve the capacity in the ministry. So, they have, so now we're here, we are talking big numbers. 15,000 uh, health facilities, 7.8 mother and child registers, so we have big numbers, of course, big challenges for, for, for our um, um, uh, programmers and our platform to stress test that. But then we also work with, uh, with doing the mother and child healthcare. We're learning from, we're stripping down the Palestine one. If you think that we go in, we solve it for one country, and we try to make it, uh, gener generify it, to make it part of the platform, so it can be used in Bangladesh, meaning not that advanced, but still with the rule, rule engines, still with the indicator from WHO. Because uh, WHO, we have now been uh, announced as a um, collaborative center for WHO. So now WHO want to use our platform to disseminate best practice and WHO indicators in every country through DHS2. And this is super new, that's also from December. And I just came back, actually with the people you saw in the movie, where Malawi was one of the countries that we are piloting with, but also 30 other countries uh, that we are piloting this or doing this um, for people that already have DHS2 um, in order to use the right best practice indicators in order to improve health. Yeah, this is a joint mission in Pakistan. Pakistan is one of our new countries, uh, moving very, very fast. So these are all the global agencies you can see there. They are, this is WHO and this is Global Fund playing around with, uh, and here's the, the, the apps that are made here by one, the same guy that made support to the, the Ghana as a master student, as a PhD student, he made this health app together with WHO and all the health programs in order to implement the best practice into the countries. You can see I have to stop. Thank you. You can check it out on this um, uh, URLs if you want to know more. Thank you. Any questions? So about uh, the point you made about Oslo, or, or Norway not adopting this uh, uh, system, I guess, uh, are you trying to do the same things, like lobbying or talking to people? Are you doing that in Norway also, or is it just uh, <laughs> passively <laughs> observing that? Uh, it's a yes, and no, and yes. We actually we were uh, involved in um, promoting a pilot. I even present this for Haya, the health minister Haya, uh, to have a pilot in Østfold for a digital health card for pregnant women, and we were turned down because they want they wanted to be make the big blow, you know, the one uh, one uh, patient record system. Today, I would say mm, maybe we shouldn't promote it so much because that's <laughs> some years ago actually. Because then it will be a silo, and we are against silos. If we cannot be integrated, then we keep silent. But still, there is a lot of, uh, of possibilities for the, for the Norwegian health sector as well. But then, actually, I think it's the learning, because one of my PhD students works now in the e, uh, uh, health, health, directorate, health Directorate, the E-Health uh, <laughs> Directorate, and this platform thinking, that is what Norway should think about, to learn from. The way of thinking platforms instead of, of having this big bang. 
and lightweight and web-based. So, so yes, we are in dialogue, and especially these days. Actually, I will meet the, the new staff secretary, what is that? Okay. Uh, not the minister, but the under tomorrow, <laughs> uh, in with the rectorate, and then discuss these things. Any more questions? No, so thank you very much. Thank you for coming. And I will also uh, and say happy uh, International Female Day, everyone, girls and boys. Okay, so now it's time for a small coffee break. So we'll be back again at quarter past two. Okay, then it's time to, to start again after the coffee. <laughs> so uh, uh, I'm happy to present the next speaker, who is Ning Zhu, uh, who is coming uh, to us from Shipstead. She's a project manager lead there. Uh, with a background in uh, ranking in image recognition from companies such as Shipstead, Microsoft and Sony. Uh, she's going to be talking about preparing for the transition data science as a student versus in industry. So, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Heidi. And, uh, well, I initially I planned to talk about something very fancy we do at Shipstead. But then I realized I only have 20 minutes. Uh, then I really can't choose what to talk about. And then they say, hey, how about my colleague said, talk about something that motivates you, what can make you feel excited. So, OK, um, then I'll talk about my own experience. So that actually motivates me. And uh, I think there's probably quite some students here today. So hopefully that can motivate you as well. And I get a slice here. Great. So, um, let me try not to stand in front of it. So, uh, as uh, Hadi introduced, today uh, my job is as a senior manager in uh, product management for data-related products in Shipstead. But uh, that's not where I started. So, initially, uh, I started uh, studying uh, computer science in uh, Tsinghua University in China. And then I continued with a master and a PhD in computer science there. And after that, I get into industry research in Sony in Tokyo for a couple of years. And then after that, I want to do more like uh, product development stuff. So I become more working in product instead of uh, really pure research. So in that sense, I'm not really a perfect role model for you sitting here today uh, because I'm not really I'm not really in research, I'm not a data scientist, but I would uh, like to provide my own experience as kind of like uh, one example of how you can proceed and uh, just to see if this maybe provides some inspiration, inspirations to you as well. So uh, I would like to say that uh, in my own experience, uh, the thing I do changes along the way. When I started as a student, I most do things in as a part of my project, uh, my part of my class project. Whatever my professor tells me to do, I do it. So they may say, okay, implement this nearest neighbor and use that to classify this data of blah and the reach and uh, classification accuracy of 85% uh, uh, plus. Okay, then I do it. I use this algorithm on this data and try to hit a certain metric. Later, when I become like a PhD, then no one's there and telling me that uh, what I should do. Actually, it become my turn to propose what I should work on. So at that time, the biggest challenge for me was to figure out what, what should I work on. And uh, I would call that the stage two that is uh, written here as academic project. And later, 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 much closer to now, when I work in industry. so. Uh, I, have, uh, I still have the freedom to choose, in, in a certain degree, to choose what I work on, but uh, the challenges I'm facing become slightly different. It's like uh, I won't choose, I won't try to solve the most uh, difficult problem. Actually, I would go for the so-called low-hanging fruits, where I can do the simple stuff and get as much project, uh, as much impact as possible. So I call that in the industry project, project. So. I'd like to share with you today, in my experience, what I see as different between those classroom project, uh, academic project, and industry project. And I want to compare them in four different aspects. 
So it will be problem, the problem we solve, data, and user, and then the peer. So from the uh, problem we work on, you can see that uh, from the classroom side, normally we work with a well-defined problem with a relatively small size of data. And then those problems, they're often already solved by someone with uh, some known solutions. So the purpose is just to kind of uh, apply those solutions and make sure that we can do it too. We understand how those were solved. And we don't really care too much about how it is in real data. We just want to do it in a, a toy data set. As long as that's fine, that's fine. However, when we move on to academic project, there uh, we work with the technical problems that is abstracted from a real, pro uh, real business scenarios. So probably we don't really care too much about, um, well, we probably still care about where those problems come from. But often when we really work on our thesis project, we work with a data set that is kind of cleaned through the real data and that is already uh, how to say, that is one layer abstraction from the real problem. And those data sets, they are often not too small. They're mid to large size, so that it's very close to a real, a real, real world challenge. And in the industry problem, often it's uh, w when we get a problem, it's not really came in the for format of a technical challenge. It's often come in as a product request. We want a user to be able to do thing X. And then it's up to us to define like uh, how uh, how to actually transfer that into a technical challenge we can solve with an algorithm. And when we deal with data now, uh, sorry, not data yet. So when we choose what to do now, we often want to choose the thing that can relatively easy to do. So the difference between academic and industry here is that in academic, you want to choose something that is difficult enough. Well, ideally, the most difficult thing that no one else can solve that, so that uh, no one will solve it halfway during your PhD, right? <laughs> and, uh, but for industry, you probably want to choose something that you know is solvable within a, like a half year or even better, a quarter. You can show some early results so that your boss will not say, okay, this is no hope, we cut it. So that's very different. So when we talk about data, we have the luxury at the beginning in classroom, we deal with relatively small and clean data. And please feel happy about that because you will never have that again as you continue in this road. So um, in academia, uh, you probably deal with lots of uh, uh, like a public open data set. Those data set, they're still relatively clean. Uh, if, if you're working on image, you can think about the, uh, the data set, open data set we use. And uh, they're not say, super, super clean as the one you use like uh, Amnist in classroom, but still, they, there are lots of researchers, students all around the world, they work on those. So they have a quite okay quality. But when you move into industry, uh, the story just changes. Uh, to be honest, I don't want to tell you this, but expe expect to use your like uh, more than half of your time to actually dealing with data cleaning. And if you only use slightly more than half, be very happy about it. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, we saw some survey and they say you actually ended up using anywhere between 70 to 90% of your time on cleaning data as a data scientist in uh, industry. Uh, why? <laughs> That's because uh, there is where you meet the real world. If you are lucky, you work with a, a very mature product, then you will have a huge amount of uh, data to play with. Or you can think about large companies like Google, but even as Chip said, think about Finn. You probably have 80% of Norwegian population on Finn quite active, and uh, you know what they sell, you know what they buy, you know what they, they're viewing, what they might want to buy. So there's a lot of data to play with. However, that's, uh, you can also get people who kind of, uh, they use some, uh, just a bot to scan thin to know what is new things published there. You get people who have some very, they use a VPN and they're all from like, uh, for, for example, maybe the same room, they share the same IP, so they appear to be a, a weird, very weird super user who make many, many page views on random stuff every day. And when you're trying to model your users, you say, hmm, this guy, he looks weird. What does he want to do? He wheels 100 thin ads every hour. It's just like, and he doesn't stop. He does <laughs> just, what, is, what does he want? 
oh, okay, later you check, you check, you realize, okay, so this is probably a VPN from some other company or some University of Oslo, maybe? <laughs> so that's not one person. What do we do? That's a dirty data, this outlier. Sorry, I have to throw that data points out. So it's not really, it's also data science to figure out what data points are actually dirty and how to deal with them. It's not easy, but uh, that's part of the challenge. It's uh, part of the game, part of the reward. So we talk about users. In Classroom, you don't have users. So what you do is like, uh, there's no real user impact. Normally what you do is just an offline test in your own computer or a cloud computer somewhere. Uh, you have a bar set by your professor that you have to match this metric. You try, you try, you try, you match it, okay, submit, that's it. And uh, in academic, things become more uh, closer to reality. So you probably work not only with uh, just a, you know, a pure research project, you also have partners, and uh, they will try your thing in their production environment, and then they will give you feedback about did it really work as it did in your research, or nah, it's not really working very well, you need to improve. So you can have some real user uh, impact there. However, it's probably still limited uh, opportunities. You don't get to try it every day. And uh, you still probably do more offline tests than online tests directly with users. In the industry, you get the lucky thing or the unlucky thing that you have impact on real users, no matter good or bad. Just think about it. You have, uh, we work on fin search algorithm. And now suddenly today we pushed a new algorithm that improves the search uh, performance by 30%. Voila, everyone's happy, great. However, the week after, uh, we made a stupid mistake. We pushed something that we thought would perform, but that just uh, recommend random stuff to people and our user hate it. I'm sorry, then your users see those bad search results immediately as well. <laughs> so for, for us now, the important thing is that we need to, we have the luxury to try with real users anytime we want. But we also have the responsibilities to deal with whatever the, the impact would be, no matter it's good or bad. So we, it's, a, it's a freedom we have, but it doesn't mean that we can just do it without thinking about the cons consequence. Let's just try it and by luck, and it might work, yeah, try that, and maybe after months, suddenly there's an alert calling you like uh, midnight, page duty calls, now your algorithm is really performing poorly, and uh, fix it now. <laughs> so, you know. And uh, the, in, as the last one of the four aspects, I want to talk about peers. So peers here, I refer to like your classmates in the school setting, your colleagues or a research mate in the academic setting, or your colleagues, or maybe colleagues in competition companies, whatever you, th you think about that. So in the classroom, you have uh, classmates who are most likely working on the exact same project as you. You can discuss, hey, how did you manage to raise 10% there? Teach me. Or maybe your teammate, you're working towards one goal, you can compare with other teams. So this is great because you can discuss on the exact thing and you can share how you can compare your notes and you can share how you manage to do better or do faster. Things change a little bit when you move forward and uh, in academic. So here you have, uh, I can say that you have uh, peers from a broader community. It's not just uh, people in your university or in your lab. Actually, you have um, whatever topic you choose, most likely you have many, many, many people somewhere in a corner in the world, they're working on very similar things as you do. So like could be someone from the US, someone from China, someone from Norway, you never know. And uh, you're sort of like competitions, competitors, but you're also like uh, friends and uh, peers working on similar stuff. So then it's uh, not that convenient to reach out to them and say, hey, how's your goal? How, how are you doing? Are you doing fine with this topic? How did you manage to get a recent uh, improvement? But still, it's still very important to do that. You need to reach out, that's why you go to conference, you submit to conference, you go to workshops, you meet people so that you still manage to keep a community where you're working on more or less similar stuff. 
and you kind of a challenge and help each other to improve the cutting edge, the state of the art. In the industry, very interesting. So you get, very, you get colleagues, uh, but the bad news, normally you don't really work on the same things. Why? Because that's called overlap. Uh, that is basically a waste of uh, duplication of efforts, waste of resources. So you get very smart colleagues, but normally you work on different things. So there will be no one around you, you can ask them, say, uh, I solve this problem in this way, can you tell me how you solve it so that I can see how we can improve? No. You will still help each other, but uh, you are kind of alone, you need to be prepared to be alone to solve a problem. And uh, the most closely, the people who work on most similar projects are either your friends in academic, so keep your friendship with them. <laughs> they can help you. Or actually, your, uh, the, uh, the people in your competition companies who are working on similar projects. So you can try, ask them how they're doing and making the progress. I'm not sure they're gonna tell you. Yeah, I'll try, like, Eli, how did you manage to do that at the Arendo? Nah, he's not telling me anything. No, we're not really in direct competition, so that's not a problem. But I would imagine it's uh, like my friend in Amazon, they're probably not going to tell me how they do product search. And uh, also, like, um, companies and companies are quite different. Just you become more alone in your area, and uh, also you probably want to become the expert, the go-to person in your company, so that uh, instead of you seeking like help from other people. Eventually, it will be other people seeking help from you on how to solve, best solve those, those problems and where should we go next. So um, that's what I think that differs most uh, in the peer aspect among those three. So after we talked about all those four aspects, from the problem, from well-defined to uh, kind of abstract to, well, you need to define it, and then from the data, clean and small, okay -ish clean, okay -ish big, uh, and then like a dirty, and from anywhere very small to very big, well, working with startup, that's very small, that's also a very fun problem to work with. And then from user, it's uh, no, no need to worry about that, or to, you need to really worry about that. And from peers, where it's just nearby and working on exactly the same thing, and uh, challenging to find them and probably not really working on the same thing. You see, it's, uh, in general, your life will be more challenging and more difficult. <laughs> it's, uh, even if you stay in academic, I'm pretty sure you can ask your professor. It's still the same direction. That's why you should really cherish your time in here today and because uh, you know the tough times are coming. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure even for myself, the tougher times are coming. I want to share some things I tried and that actually didn't help, and then something I tried and that helped. I'll start with things didn't help, so it kind of ends at a, you know, a, a higher note at the end. So the things I, I tried that didn't help, things number one, I'll just share five, I'm pretty sure there's more, just for your information. T just things one, uh, trying to team up with really, really good, hardworking classmates and then just be lazy. My friend, that doesn't help, please remember. So I tried that uh, in all my projects, just team up with some really good guys and they do all the work, I just sign my name. Believe me, that helps in short term, uh, it doesn't help much in long term, not at all. So please don't do that. And if we have professors here, please also tell your students, don't do that, that doesn't help in long term. And second is that to try random open source models without thinking through. I'm, I have to admit, I did lots of this kind of stuff. Like, uh, you know, there are so many open source stuff, resources out there. Just try them. I mean, one of them always give me a little bit better results. But if I don't think about why they give me better results, just randomly switch over stuff. When they, when they don't work, I have no clue why they don't work. And that will be a hard lesson to learn. And the third thing is that tune the matrix instead of tune the models. So uh, we all probably al also tried that a little bit. So there are diff very different uh, like uh, accuracy metrics. There's a uh, one or two, this and that. We, we can always pick the one that we perform best, right? Don't do that, that doesn't help either. <laughs> you better think about why one matrix is performing, you're performing on one and not as good on the other one. Don't tune matrix. 
The number four is manipulate the data manually to throw out the difficult examples. And that's not good either. I have to admit I did that. You know, whenever I just try manually use my eyes instead of uh, my algorithm to try the examples. Nah, don't do that either. The last one I want to show here is that just don't wait until last minutes before deadline. That's, uh, that's human, human nature, but it doesn't really help, no matter in classroom project or later as a job. Don't do that. So things actually helped me. So first, be curious about what other people are working on. This can always, always, always help. So at the beginning, it's just about, oh, I solved this as the teacher said, and uh, hey, you managed to do better than me. How did you manage to do that? Then I get to learn more. But later, when I was in PhD, it's really important to get inspired by other people's work so that I know where I should go and uh, I know where this same algorithm can be useful as well. And that helped me all the way until now, because uh, in industry, you don't always work on exactly the same thing. Think about it. Like, you, you stay in bachelor like uh, three, four years, master, PhD, three, four, five years, but how long do you work? 20 years, 30 years, you change topics. So be curious about what other people do because that maybe one day you can switch over too if that's something fun. And keep cost and performance in mind. This is something I didn't pay much attention from early on, but uh, as I work on industry now, that's the number one question I got from my boss all the time. So what the cost, uh, the pros and cons, cost and benefit. So better to have that in mind from early on. The third point, stay updated, like updated about the latest progress from uh, research. So you can see that uh, um, actually it's always uh, academic, they're one step forward, the industry. And some large companies, I have to admit, they maybe do better than Shipstead, <laughs> like in technology part, like a TensorFlow, we use that too. It's made by Google, not by Shipstead. So it's good to keep progress, keep the tap on those progress so that you know where you should use them. And then we also want to say, try things hands down, that's especially to myself, and uh, because I chose to be in product instead of research. So many people, after they become manager, they stop doing things hands down, then they lose the, the feeling. So I would say that uh, it's really good if you can really always try things hands down. And the end, I would say that uh, write papers, technical sketches, or blogs, whatever that is slightly long format and uh, require you to think things through and then kind of uh, circulate around to get feedback and uh, comments. Because, you know, share your thoughts with others and uh, listen to other people's feedback, that always help to, to, to understand like where you are, if there's something to improve. Hopefully those will be helpful to you too. And uh, any questions and Ah, we are, you can reach me always by this email, we're recruiting, <laughs> both full time and also we take thesis project from a PhD and master student. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very Thank you. Ah, thank you. Do I still uh, got time for questions? No, we're, we're, Probably. I don't. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, we don't have time for questions, but there is going to be uh, a social event later, so uh, I suggest you take the opportunity to talk to, to Ning then. So. Yeah, and you got my email here. Yeah. So. Thank you very much. Okay, so the next talk is by uh, Hoda Amel. Uh, she is Chief Operating Officer of Tactic Real-Time Marketing. Uh, and she'll be talking about how to avoid your DPA's mo most wanted list. Hi. Um, so I'm going to talk about how to avoid your DPA's most wanted list. If move it a bit. Can everyone hear me? Is this better? Okay, I tend to talk a little quiet, so. Um, so I'll just go ahead and start. Um, one of the big things that comes into, so a DPA, first of all, is a data protection authority. And the biggest legislation, or the newest changes that have happened to privacy is the GDPR, otherwise known as the General Data Protection Regulation. 
lots of words to say. Um, basically, uh, this is the biggest change that has happened over a full generation of privacy regulations to the, uh, to the European Union. It comes into effect on May 25th of this year. Um, it has new consent rules, rights for data subjects, and updated governance models. These are things that I'm going to kind of break down a little bit more slowly. But the main goal of the GDPR is basically um, to give rights back to data subjects and bring privacy back to the users and transparency back um, between the companies and the users itself. I want to talk about how the GDPR should be focusing all your attention and demanding of the full attention to be focused around developing privacy as a corporate and a social responsibility. Right now, the GDPR is something that a lot of companies are very afraid of um, and really worried about, and rightfully so, because there are a lot of strict guidelines that go across with it. Um, one of the big things is that it requires a lot of internal assessments, so you have to overview, uh, you have to look over the entire data flow of how your company is processing data, using data, storing data, um, it gets really involved um, as far as looking over and being able to impact whether or not you have um, certain private information coming through and if you're establishing user control for all those areas. Um, it also requires updated contract regulations, so if you're working with other companies that are passing data to each other, to and from each other, um, that data uh, basically has to be uh, ma managed and audited between both companies, and both companies are held responsible for each other in that case. So any of your business partners are now held responsible for privacy regulations. Um, the risk of external audits, or this is from your DPA, basically they'll start to look at the different audits um, over your entire system, and if they think that there's been a breach or that you've done something incorrectly, um, they, you have the risk of an audit from a DPA officer. If they find anything, um, basically if they find anything, uh, you get this fine or a violation. And the fines are huge. This affects any company um, that works with data in the EU, or it affects any company in the, in the EU that has EU users. So it doesn't matter where your company sits, as long as you have users that are from the EU, uh, this applies to you. Um, the fines are extremely heavy, um, because the fines end up being 4% over your annual turnover, um, or 20 million euro. I don't know how they make the decision, to be honest, but it's one of the two. Both are scary. Um, so I want to talk about why we actually, why this is happening. And so the reason why this is happening is that the EU doesn't feel that just, or just having security over your data is enough. Um, one of the common misconceptions is that data security is also data privacy. So I'm going to kind of break this down into a real life example. Um, instead of talking about data and privacy and security, we'll talk about it in a way where we say that you you have a um, you have a house that you're going to be showing. You've like you've moved out of your house and you've taken all of your mail and your pictures, anything that can identify you personally from this house, and it's basically just furniture inside. After you're done showing the house, um, when you leave, you end up locking the door. That's an example of how data security would work, is it's really just an outside layer of protection. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's protecting anything inside. It's just building this fence or a garden or um, having a lock, for example, on the information or whatever is inside. If it's your furniture, it's your furniture. The difference is why I use a house that's empty for this example is that when somebody comes in, um, let's say somebody breaks in, they've unlocked your door and they come in, now you're personal information is protected because you've already moved out. You've moved, um, you've moved all your information out so you don't have any, they don't find any mail, they don't find your credit cards, they don't find anything of value um, that's easy for them to take. That's an example of data privacy. So you can't have data privacy without having data security enabled first, but you can have data security without having data privacy. The second misconception is that data science and data privacy aren't friends and that they can't really work together. And the reason this is is because data science looks at maximizing data opportunities and being able to expose data in different ways um, so that it can be used to find you know, new innovative ways to use data. Data privacy and data privacy advocates is kind of the opposite. Um, it's not, it's opposite just in the way that they want, they, privacy advocates only want you to use the minimum amount of data um, or have a purpose for the data that you're going to be using. 
Um, but both of them, even though they do seem kind of far apart and very opposite, both of them come in the middle where they actually do something that's supposed to benefit the user or a consumer in the way that's, um, that, that is better for the business as a whole and better for both the consumer as, as, as a person as well. These are different ways where data science and privacy can meet when you're actually looking into your data. Um, you can have pseudo-anonymization, anonymization, or basically basic minimization. These are three different kinds of ways that you can look at data and still extract or work with it in a privacy setting and apply privacy around it. So you have pseudo-anonymization, which is like somewhat like tokenization, um, where you can take in different fields and put an extra layer on top you also have anonymization where you can go through and completely remove the private information and put in a different way to associate it. Um, so you're just constantly referring to it as something that is anonymous. And then minimization, again, is only using what you need um, and really refining the data and the groups that you have so that you only work um, with what you have a specific use case for. I want to take a moment and have everybody think about the next few things um, as far as GDPR and the privacy regulations that are coming out as more of just a data subject. So think of yourself not as a company or the company benefit, and this is usually where I start when I ta start talking to other companies about this, is try to think of yourself as a user first, and then these regulations start to make a little bit more sense, and they start to become agreeable where you start to see more of a social responsibility adapting for it. So there's a difference between personal data and sensitive data. I'm going to clarify this because I keep mentioning them and maybe not everybody's on the same page of it. <laughs> so personal data is anything, it's one data source that I can tie back to you. So that could be an email address, it goes straight to you, it could be a phone number, an address, it could be a tel an IP address, so a telephone. It's one data source where I need to find out who that actual individual is. Sensitive data is a bit different. It can be anything that can be discriminatory or used in a discriminatory manner. So if I say gender, sexual orientation, religion, um, anything like that that can be applied to somebody, that's considered sensitive data. It can be anything from spending habits as well, you know, depending on the credit scores or how or fraudulent activity that you've had. That can be considered sensitive data also. Um, the difference with GDPR is how it looks at personal, uh, PII is personal, personally identifiable information, um, but how it looks at PII and sensitive data. And in GDPR, it basically says that if you have enough sensitive data, um, you can basically link these together and filter down to the person that you're trying to get to. So eventually, if you have enough linkage through sensitive data, you can identify a user. And it's very easy to think about that. If I were to take this room, for example, and say that I had this, or I had all the data in this room and I could start to drill down between, okay, I can pick men over women in this room and start to drill down more on sensitive data, you can start to see how it becomes a game of guess who. So let's talk about the new rights that GDPR has um, for the different users. I do have to keep looking at the screen because I don't have them all memorized. But um, so one of them is the right to be f con uh, informed. This is a right that you will have for consent. I can go over this a little bit more after this one. Um, but it's basically the right to be informed any time a company makes changes and how their business pro practices work. What companies they're working with, where they're storing their data, all that kind of information, you have the right to as a specific user now. You also have the right to access. And this means not just access like a platform that it's on or, or anything like that, but it means the right to access your, um, your data. Uh, so you can request a company to give you all the data that it has on you now. Um, we also have the right to rectification if something's wrong or if you want something deleted, like just one thing, you can go ahead and you can, you can do that as well. Um, and then right to be forgotten is also commonly used as the right to erasure. This is something where they can actually um, go in and you can be completely deleted from a system. Um, and that's pretty new. Uh, and that's why, that's one of the things that's actually really scary for companies is because this is something that has never been thought about before. So companies from the ground up have been looking at ways to, you know, oh, we're gonna start to collect your data. And now when you come back and you ask for it and you ask for it to be deleted, they have to look for all of your personal information across all their servers, all their data warehouses, everything um, where that information is being spread, as well as your sensitive data, and figure out a way to pull that information completely from their system and from all their third parties that they've sold that data to or transferred that data with. Um, so it starts to be a little bit 
Uh, scary if you're on the other side, but as a user, sounds great. Um, so then you also have the right to restriction of processing. If you don't want your data to be processed with other companies, you should be able to say no. Um, and then data portability and the right to object. These are all things where you can say, you know, you can, you can opt out necessarily of, of what terms and conditions uh, you want your data to be used in. Um, the other thing is data breaches. Companies have to tell you within 72 hours if there's been a breach. Um, I like this one because in the US, where I'm from, um, there were instances where credit card companies uh, or, or credit companies in general had data breaches but didn't tell consumers for about six months later. So three days, sounds great. Um, so the other thing is, is consent. And consent is a huge thing that GDPR introduces. Consent basically follows a few different principles and it's one of them is that it requires an actual opt-in so that the person actually has to consent to something. Just because you sign up for a platform or just because you interact with something doesn't mean now anymore um, that you have consented to use it. So you actually have to do something like check a tick box or be involved and actively um, participate in a consent way. The other thing is that it has to be, um, it's really hard to see, um, it has to be um, specifically detailed, so it has to be legible, it has to, um, it can't be in complete legal terms, and it has to be something where every operation of that company where they're transferring your data is actually listed. Um, the other one is that it has to be approved by a data controller, um, so the language can't be super legal. So when you open something up, it's, you're not filled with, you don't need a law degree to read it, basically. Um, and then the last one is that consent has to be dynamic. And what I love about this is that you can at any point turn around and say that you don't give your consent anymore. And this is really different um, from the ways that we've been working. Previously, you, were, you could just say, okay, I, you know, I, I, I'm just gonna delete or I'm just gonna log off and I'm not gonna have that information anymore. But to be able to erase all of your information or say, you know, the processes have changed now, I don't consent to this, um, is a really established right for a user. So with all of these processes in play, um, some of the things that go uh, around this, uh, or around introducing privacy um, into your organization, uh, because we've been talking about it just on a user basis, but when you bring it back to your organization, it has to do with data governance. And just so there's a little bit of awareness, I tried to um, Google <laughs> data, or, uh, data governance models um, to try to see how, uh, how involved privacy was, because for me, I'm really invo involved in privacy groups work in advertising industry, so I have to be. Um, but for others, privacy is really neglected or it's obsolete, especially in data governance models. And so since the last time I looked at data governance models was a while ago, I had to go and I, you know, I just Googled. And the first few results that I went through, um, it's really difficult to find anything on data protection or data privacy. The only things that you see is that it's actually just listed and it says, there will be a new um, GDPR that's coming out or a new regulation that's coming out around privacy, and that's it. Otherwise, if you search privacy, the only other thing that pops up is that on the very bottom it says, view our privacy policy on whatever site that you're on. Um, so the integration of, of having privacy at the core of your data governance strategy really helps align your team. Um, and so by doing that, you need to have people and process. It goes back to the whole thing of having people process technology um, but in this, it really focuses on the people and the process in order to be able to do that. So the GDPR specifically says that if your organization is large enough, you need to have a DPO in. Um, and the processes are basically whether you're a data processor or a controller. Privacy by design, um, I'm not gonna go all the way through it, um, <laughs> so it doesn't seem like we have time. But privacy by design, are, these are seven principles. Anybody can look them up, they're online, freely available. Um, is a really good way to start integrating uh, privacy into your, um, uh, into your company as a whole. Um, these principles I took um, from the US and, and integrate them into the startup that I currently work for, which is Tactic. Um, and when I first started, they didn't have a, um, they, we didn't have a privacy core or, or anything um, like that. We were just kind of going with it. And I really wanted, it was very important to me to bring privacy by design as a standard into our company and have everything that we were working with um, revolve around privacy. And so we work with different customers, creative agencies and media agencies. And with this, we had to look at all the different places in the ecosystem where privacy was exposed 
And the way that I recommend doing this or integrating privacy by design, um, the first principle is to be proactive and not reactive. We did this in a very reactive way because um, we're trying to get ready for GDPR. So we're reacting to a law that was made. But what I have to say is when you look at, um, when you look at privacy as a social or a corporate responsibility of yours, you have to be proactive. Meaning you can't wait for the law to tell you that you should be doing these things for your users. You should be looking at how your user interacts with you and what things you can actually be doing to add value to that user and to give them more control over their own privacy. And that's what privacy by design like, actually focuses on. So in working through all of those principles through our data governance model, um, we actually had our developers start stop um, just developing things and, and coming to me saying, well, we kind of are doing this and, and now this has moved over here and, and me just kind of with my hands over my head, like not really sure how we were going to restructure everything. To now, after full education of what privacy by design is, we actually work together and they come to me with questions that I have to go research because I wasn't really positive about anything. Um, and I think that that's a good place to be. So I recommend that everybody, um, if you're interested in bringing privacy into it, especially if you're working with data, you have to be. Um, so you have to know these by yourself. But it's a really good way to start meeting the different people within your industry and to be able to have um, legal conversations about how you're going to actually govern the data that's there and build those principles in. Thank you. OK, so we have time for one question. Anyone? Uh, I was uh, reading an article the other day that Norway's uh, Ministry of something, I don't remember which exactly, which one, um, announced that Norway is not ready for the deadline in May for GDPR. And then I read that 26 of the EU countries are not going to be ready either. What do you think about you know, businesses in Norway or yeah, I mean, I think, you. yeah, as far as GDPR readiness, um, one of the things is to be as ready as you can um, for it. So it's kind of the practice of um, checking through, auditing through everything. If you just sit and you're, you, as a company, you just kind of wait and you aren't um, reactive, uh, any uh, DPA or data protection authority can basically come after and say, you weren't even trying to prepare. As long as you have information that shows that you were making an effort, showing that you're trying to, it's really up to every single DPA how serious they're going to take it and how far they're going to take um, the violation. But as long as you show that you're auditing, have consent mechanisms in place, um, and then follow the key principles, so you know, give, you're giving access or rights to your data subjects, or you have a roadmap for how you're going to be able to do that by the end of the year, should, you should have a better conversation. Um, so I don't know about you don't need to be completely ready. I think that that's a really hard tell um, to just have a, a deadline. I mean, granted, everybody should be working towards that. It's just whether or not you've actually taken the steps in that process or not. Thank you very much. Thanks, <laughs>